history, apologetics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. The power of the rosary is beyond question. The rosary is more than just a devotion to Our Lady. The beads and chain of the rosary itself are often a reflection of our character and our hope. Catholics are buried with rosaries, wound carefully about folded hands. There is no greater symbol than this of the primacy the rosary has in Catholic devotion. As Catholics, we know, we do not merely believe, we know, that the rosary is the most powerful recitation we can make when we desire a miracle or some other grace from God. By reflecting on our Blessed Mother's experiences and the life of Jesus, we become more like the woman who bore all things for the sake of obedience to God's will. The Mother of God knew the loss of her only child at the hands of unjust executioners. She witnessed the sick and the dying, and she asked Jesus to perform miracles, which he obliged his mother. We know that Mary retains this respect, so by asking for her intercession with Jesus, we too can change in accord with God's will. Sister Lucia of Fatima told us that there is no problem, I tell you, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot solve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. With the Holy Rosary, we will save ourselves. We will sanctify ourselves. We will console our Lord and obtain the salvation of many souls. True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary by St. Louis de Montfort The use of this devotion when we receive Holy Communion. Before Holy Communion, you must humble yourself most profoundly before God. You must renounce your corrupt interior and your dispositions, however good your self-love may make them look. You must renew your consecration by saying, I am all thine, my dear mistress, with all that I have. You must implore that good mother to lend you her heart, that you may receive her son there with the same dispositions as her own. You will explain to her that it touches her son's glory to be put into a heart so sullied and so inconstant as yours which would not fail to either lessen his glory or to destroy it. But if she will come and dwell with you in order to receive her son, she can do so by the dominion which she has over all hearts, and her son will be well received by her without stain, without danger of being outraged or unnoticed. God is in the midst thereof, it shall not be moved. Psalm 45, 6. You will tell her confidently that all you have given her of your goods is little enough to honor her, but that by holy communion you wish to make her the same present as the Eternal Father gave her, and that you will honor her more by that than if you gave her all the goods in the world. And finally, that Jesus, who loves her in a most special manner, still desires to take his pleasure and repose in her, even in your soul, though it be far filthier and poorer than the stable where he did not hesitate to come, simply because she was there. You will ask her for her heart by these tender words, I take thee for my all, give me thy heart, O Mary. After the Our Father, just before receiving Jesus Christ, we say three times, Lord, I am not worthy. Say the first one to the Eternal Father, telling him you are not worthy because of your evil thoughts and ingratitude to so good a father to receive his only Son, but that he is to behold Mary, his handmaid, behold the handmaid of the Lord, who acts for you, and gives you a singular confidence and hope with his majesty, for thou singularly hast settled me in hope. Psalm 4.10. You will say to the Son, Lord, I am not worthy, telling him that you are not worthy to receive him because of your idle and evil words, and your infidelity to his service, but that nevertheless you pray him to have pity on you because you are about to bring him into the house of his own mother and yours, and that you will not let him go without his coming to lodge with her. I held him and will not let him go till I bring him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that bore me. Canticles 3.4 You will pray to him to rise and come to the place of his repose and into the ark of his sanctification. Arise, Lord, into thy resting place, thou and the ark which thou hast sanctified. Psalm 131. Tell him you put no confidence at all in your own merits, your own strength, and your own preparations, as Esau did, but that you trust only in Mary, your dear mother, as the little Jacob did in Rebekah. Tell him that, sinner and Esau that you are, 
you dare to approach his sanctity, supported and adorned as you are with the virtues of his Holy Mother. You will say to the Holy Ghost, Lord, I am not worthy, telling him that you are not worthy to receive this masterpiece of his charity because of the lukewarmness and iniquity of your actions and because of your resistance to his inspirations, but that all your confidence is in Mary, his faithful spouse. You will say with St. Bernard, She is my greatest security. She is the source of all my hope. You can even pray him to come himself in Mary, his inseparable spouse, telling him that her bosom is as pure and her heart as burning as ever, and that without his descent into your soul, neither Jesus nor Mary will be formed nor worthily lodged. After Holy Communion, inwardly recollected and holding your eyes shut, you will introduce Jesus into the heart of Mary. You will give him to his mother, who will receive him lovingly, will place him honorably, will adore him profoundly, will love him perfectly, will embrace him closely, and will render to him, in spirit and in truth, many homages which are unknown to us in our thick darkness. Or else you will keep yourself profoundly humbled in your heart in the presence of Jesus residing in Mary. Or else you will sit like a slave at the gate of the king's palace, where he is speaking with the queen, and while they talk to each other without need of you, you will go in spirit to heaven and over all the earth, praying all creatures to thank, to adore, and to love Jesus and Mary in your place. Come, let us adore. Psalm 94. Or else you will yourself ask of Jesus, in union with Mary, the coming of his kingdom on earth, through his holy mother. Or you will sue for divine wisdom or divine love, or for the pardon of your sins, or for some other grace, but always by Mary and in Mary, saying, while you look aside at yourself, Lord, look not at my sins, but let your eyes look at nothing in me but the virtues and merits of Mary. And then remembering your sins, you will add, It is I who have committed these sins, or you will say, Deliver me from the unjust and deceitful man, or else, my Jesus, you must increase in my soul, and I must decrease. Mary, you must increase within me, and I must be still less than I have been. O Jesus and Mary, increase in me, and multiply yourselves outside in others also. There are an infinity of other thoughts which the Holy Ghost furnishes, and will furnish you, if you are thoroughly interior, mortified, and faithful to this grand and sublime devotion which I have been teaching you. But always remember that the more you allow Mary to act in your communion, the more Jesus will be glorified, and you will allow Mary to act for Jesus and Jesus to act in Mary in the measure that you humble yourself and listen to them in peace and in silence without troubling yourself about seeing, tasting, or feeling. For the just man lives throughout on faith, and particularly in Holy Communion, which is an action of faith. My just man liveth by faith. Hebrews 10.38 The following is an excerpt from Sister Lucia's Calls from the Message of Fatima, the Fatima call for the sanctification of the family. This is what Sister Lucia Fatima said about the upbringing of children. Even when the children are entrusted to the care of competent teachers, what remains most engraved in the hearts of children is what they have received in their father's arms and on their mother's lap. Nothing can dispense parents from this sublime mission. God has entrusted it to them, and they are answerable to God for it. Parents are the ones who must guide their children's first steps to the altar of God, teaching them to raise their innocent hands and to pray, helping them to discover how to find God on their way and to follow the echo of His voice. This is the most serious and important mission that has been entrusted by God to parents, and they must fulfill it so well that throughout their lives, the memory of their parents will always arouse in their children the memory of God and of His teaching. Now, some parents might say, well, how should we do this? How can I do this? Well, there are five ways. One, be faithful people. Pray for guidance and decisions, and seek to deepen your relationship with God, and always to Jesus through Mary. Two, teach your children to be generous and of service to others. 
Three, let the children see you pray and pray with them in ordinary and extraordinary circumstances. The rosary, the daily rosary with the family. Four, make and demand sacrifice. Help children see both by example and by what you expect of them that a holy and a happy life involves sacrifice. Five, show your faithfulness. Talk with the children about how putting your trust in Jesus and Mary affects your life. Let's review. One, be faith-filled people. Two, teach your children to be generous and of service to others. Three, let the children see you pray and pray with them. The rosary. Four, make and demand sacrifice. And five, show your faithfulness. Talk with your children about how putting your trust in Jesus and Mary affects your life. The family is a glorious institution that leads to heaven. And as St. Paul says, parents will be saved by the care they take of their children. Stay with us. We'll be back with more From the Housetops after this break. I only have one station on all the time. It is EWTN, but 89.3 is what I listen to because I want to be with the Lord every single day and every single minute. So, Lord, please keep 89.3 on air and strong and getting stronger every day. Thank you, 89.3. On the WQPH Community Calendar. This is Peter and Jemmy, host of Your Prayer Intentions, every Saturday here on 89.3 WQPH Shirley Fitchburg. There's going to be a rosary at St. Bernard's parish at St. Camillus Church at Mechanic Street, Fitchburg. On Saturday the 10th at noon, I will be leading that rosary. If you can make the event, come to the event. And if you can't make the event, listen to the show. And of course, uh, we're doing something about adopting bishops where people pray for bishops. The bishops of the country are always under attack by the devil. Just as we're always, the devil's always trying to nail us, they're always trying to nail our bishops as our leaders. So uh, we'll give you more details on that as time progresses. But even without us doing something officially, pick a bishop. Pick any state, any diocese. Pick a bishop and pray for that bishop. And you will be helping him do God's work. You're listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. We would appreciate your support to keep WQPH on the air. Please send your most generous donation to WQPH, Post Office Box 589, Medford, Massachusetts, 02155. That's Post Office Box 589, Medford, Massachusetts, 02155. You may also send your support online by visiting our website at wqphradio.org and click on the Donate button on the right. A credit card or PayPal is accepted online. You may also become a monthly supporter of WQPH through the Eternal Life Radio Guild. For more information, call 781-218-2834. 781-218-2834. Thank you for your support and for listening to WQPH. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. While voting is always a moral obligation, sometimes that obligation is stronger than at other times. This is especially true when pro-life people have an opportunity to elect in a close race someone who is committed to protect the unborn and remove from office someone else who isn't. The closer a race is, the more each person's vote counts. Let's vote for life. This is Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. This is Peter and Jemmy author of Hail Mary, the Perfect Protestant and Catholic Prayer. You should jump on to WQPH Saturday starting at 11. We begin with Local Matters, followed by the 13th Apostle, then me on Your Prayer Intentions, and then Talk Catholic. And every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. from the housetops, and then at midnight, Benedict's Hammer, right here on WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. Hi, I'm Bob Young. I live in Lemonster. Uh, I want to thank W. QPH for being here, 89.3 FM. Great day for the fall, pumpkins and apple and socializing. It's just great down to be down here. Our quest for happiness, the creation of man. As we have seen, God created the earth first and prepared and beautified it with a great abundance and variety of things. Only then did he create man, the crown and final masterpiece. 
When God was about to create the first human being, he held counsel, so to speak, in the depths of the Blessed Trinity. The three divine persons deliberated and decided from all eternity. Genesis 1.26 Let us make man to our image and likeness, and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the air, and the beasts, and the whole earth, and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. And God created man to his own image. To the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And then in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the slime of the earth, and breathed into his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We know that the first man's name was Adam, from the Bible account of the naming of the animals, which says that they were all led to Adam. This name means the man, and designates the head of the human race the one from whom all human beings have descended. Genesis 2.19 And the Lord God, having formed out of the earth all the beasts of the earth and all the fowls of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. For whatsoever Adam called any living creature, the same is its name. From Genesis we know that for Adam's body God used matter already created. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth. Since Adam was made to show forth the power and wisdom and beauty and other perfections of God, his body was the most perfect thing in visible creation, that is, superior to all other material things. There is another and a much more important reason why man is the most perfect creature on earth. This reason is that man has a spiritual soul. God formed man's body from the dust of the earth, but he breathed into his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Therefore, man's soul is created directly by God. Not only did Almighty God create Adam's soul directly, but since then he has thus created the soul of every human being born into the world. Every human body since Adam and Eve is produced by the God-given powers of parents, but the soul is created directly by God at the very moment it is united with the body. The presence of the soul gives the body life, And when the soul departs, the body becomes lifeless and gradually returns to dust. Adam's soul was spiritual, as all human souls are spiritual. A spiritual soul has neither length, nor depth, nor breadth. It has neither shape, nor parts. It cannot be seen by the eyes, or touched by the hands, or known by any of the senses. If a man were to lose an arm or leg, he would not at the same time lose a piece of his soul. His soul would remain whole and entire. Adam's soul was by nature immortal, as all human souls are naturally immortal. This means that the human soul can never perish or die. Immortality follows from the fact that the soul is a spirit, which being simple has no material parts. Not being made up of parts, it is impossible for the soul ever to decompose, corrupt, or perish. The human soul will live through all eternity. Think what manner of father he is who makes us such a gift. Every living, visible creature has a principle of life. This principle of life in man we call a soul. This principle of life or soul in man is a spirit. In living creatures lower than man, this life principle is not a spirit. That man's soul is a spirit can be proved by the fact that it can perform spiritual acts such as thinking and willing. Animals cannot think. They never improve themselves. They act by instinct, always the same, century after century. After the creation of Adam, God placed him in a garden of pleasure to cultivate and keep it. Genesis 2.18 And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. Let us make him a help like unto himself. Then the Lord God cast a deep sleep upon Adam, And when he was fast asleep, he took one of his ribs and filled up flesh for it. And the Lord God built the rib which he took from Adam into a woman and brought her to Adam. And Adam said, This now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. It was fitting that God should form Eve from Adam, since he was the head of the human race. Adam also gave the first woman her name. And Adam called his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all the living.
God said that it was not good for man to be alone, that is, without a helpmate like unto himself. Therefore God created Eve to be man's companion and helpmate. Eve thus was made the queen of the visible creation, as Adam had been made its king. God further made woman in order that the human race should be continued, and heaven peopled. For he commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth. They were to assist God in bringing human beings into existence for his greater honor and glory. And now, words of wisdom from Hammond's Meditations. The thought of hell has a triple effect of making us expiate our past sins, correct our actual sins, and prevent those to which the future may expose us. First, we must expiate our past sins. Filled with the thought that we have deserved hell, and that God has pardoned us only on the condition that we offer him a compensation by penance. There is no penance which seems too hard, and the soul need rather to be restrained than excited, as in the case of the hermits of Egypt, who, because of a single fault, condemned themselves during their whole life to austerities at which our effeminacy would tremble. Second, the thought of hell corrects actual faults. Seriously meditating upon this thought makes it impossible to remain a single day in a state of sin, even when it is doubtful. It is folly to risk our eternity and not to take the sure means for escaping a misfortune, which is, at the same time, terrible and eternal. Third, this thought prevents sins to which the future might expose us. When we say, like St. Teresa, always, never, always suffer, never an end to our sufferings, never a moment of freedom from them. It is impossible to expose ourselves voluntarily to the danger of sin, not to watch over ourselves, our actions, our words, our thoughts, not to fly from everything that would expose our salvation to danger, even occasions and appearances of sin, dissipation, idleness, dangerous society, books or conversations into which too great freedom enters. It is impossible, lastly, not to pray with our whole heart and not to take every precaution to avoid sin. St. John Bosco, the great friend of youth, once said, Frequent Holy Communion and Daily Mass are the two pillars of education. At Immaculate Heart of Mary School in Still River, Massachusetts, students are blessed to attend the traditional Latin Mass as part of their daily schedule. Immaculate Heart of Mary School was started in 1976 in response to the needs of families who identified a crisis in Catholic education. To the present day, the brothers and sisters of the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary continue their educational mission. Immaculate Heart of Mary School, grades 1 through 12, teaches the Catholic faith and its spiritual goals with no apologies. Immaculate Heart of Mary School, preserving traditional Catholic education. For more information, contact ImmaculateHeartSchool.org. The Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary have published two excellent pamphlets for basic Catholic apologetics, The One True Church and The Church or the Bible, Mission Sermons by Father Arnold Damon. Father Damon was born in the province of North Brabant, Holland, in 1815. He was admitted to the Society of Jesus in 1837 and was one of the band of young novices brought over to this country by Father de Smet, renowned Jesuit missionary to the American Indians. In his illustrious career, which spanned some 50 years of apostolic work before his death on January 1, 1890, Father Damon and his companions conducted missions in nearly every principal city of the United States. He is said to have been more widely known in this country, and at one time to have exercised personally a greater influence than any bishop or priest in the Catholic Church. Little wonder, for by his majestic presence and force of eloquence, Father Damon, as a missionary, rose to a success that surpassed anything ever before or since known in America. The fiery apostolic zeal of this beloved priest can only scarcely be measured by the 12,000 conversions to Catholicism for which he was responsible, often receiving as many as 60 or 70 souls into the church in one day. It must be noted, too, that amidst all of this remarkable apostolic labor, he managed to found the first Jesuit parish in Chicago, and the first college, which later became Loyola University. The One True Church explains clearly and charitably that the only church established by Jesus Christ is the Catholic Church. 
in the Church or the Bible, Father Damon proves without any doubt that the Bible cannot be the sole rule of faith, which is claimed by Protestantism. For your free copy of The One True Church and The Church or the Bible, contact us at info at saintbenedict.com, S-A-I-N-T-B-E-N-E-D-I-C-T dot com, or write to us at St. Benedict Center, P.O. Box 1000, Still River, Massachusetts, 01467. From the Housetops Radio is produced by the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of St. Benedict Center, Still River, Massachusetts. Please join us in attaining our goals by praying for this apostolate and spreading the word about From the Housetops Radio. For more information about the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, visit www.saintbenedict.com. That's S-A-I-N-T Benedict.com, all one word. Well, that concludes our program for this week. We hope you've enjoyed listening to From the Housetops Radio. That which you hear in the ear, preach from the housetops. Until next time, God bless you. From the Housetops is produced by the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.